Welcome to the Church of Columbus, amen, where we see the impossible become possible. The psalmist said, I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. And I hope you came with a made up mind this morning to rejoice and to be glad in the power and the presence of the Lord. Worship as they sing, I will not be denied. I came with a made up mind this morning and I will not be denied the prayers and the petitions that I'm asking God for. How about you? Let us worship as they sing. God bless you this morning. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name today. Are you ready to worship God this morning? We had the greatest opportunity this morning to set the stage for God to come up behind this sacred desk and bring his word to us today. So let's worship him this evening. I would not be denied. fasting month, month of October. Please remember to keep your 24-hour prayer time. Don't break it. God's already doing some great things. Mr. Richard, I think, is going to mention this later, but we had eight receive uh, or was baptized last week, and two or three received the Holy Ghost. God didn't wait till the end of October. Hallelujah. Well, glory. Look at somebody and say, it's good to be here today. God bless you. You may be seated. I, uh, it's been a while since I've taught, so I'm uh, a little rusty. As a matter of fact, the guys up in the sound booth, hey, Duke. That's not his real name. He'll remain anonymous for now. <laughs> want to make sure he gets it right first. <laughs> I gave him a bunch of stuff to uh, post and didn't give it to him in any particular order. 
So this, this might be a, quite an experience for all of us here in the next little while. <laughs> uh, I told you a while back that I was going to talk about uh, uh, <clears throat> why prayers were not answered. And uh, I, wanted, I want to do that today. We're going to get to it as much as we can. And uh, <clears throat> I want to start with four things that hinder prayer. Four things that hinder prayer. You know, there's not much you can do that's more important than prayer. You imagine getting married. How many are married? Raise your hand. Okay, what about the rest of you folks? You're with somebody. Let's try that one more time. How many in this sanctuary are married? Would you mind raising your hand? Oh, that's better. Yeah. You won't have to tell your wife you're sitting with somebody you don't know. Uh, <clears throat> you imagine getting married and then for the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years not communicating? Now, you know, that happens after you've been married 40 or 50 years, but certainly not the first 10 or 20. <laughs> when you <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Truth being spoken here. But... <laughs> Especially when you, when you <laughs> the first few years, at least you walk in and you greet your husband, you greet your wife, and you have a rapport. You communicate with one another. You probably wouldn't be married 30 or 40, 50 years if you didn't. And yet people receive the Holy Ghost or baptized in Jesus' name, and some of them don't think again about prayer. I need to communicate with God. He just filled me with his life-giving spirit. I need to communicate with him. <clears throat> Amen. But there are four stumbling blocks that uh, can hinder prayer, and that's what I want to talk to you about for the next little bit. And we're going to get to as much of this <clears throat> as, we, uh, as we possibly can. Uh, Satan and flesh <clears throat> constantly thrust before the saints of God stumbling blocks to prevent us uh, from praying. And, of course, his first segment, as I mentioned, is on prayer. It's about these four stumbling blocks, which are the four biggest killers of a godly prayer life. James chapter 4, verse 3. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss. It is possible to pray a prayer and be rejected by God in return answer because our prayer missed the mark. Like an archer draws back a bow, aims at a target. We've got to aim our prayers directly at the center of God's will in order for that prayer to be answered. We shouldn't pray for God to fulfill, fulfill our selfish wants. There's a lot of stuff we want we don't need. <clears throat> Amen. But it's possible to misfire and miss because we're not praying for what God wants. We're praying for what we want. <clears throat> Amen. Uh, <clears throat> if our lives are not in the right spiritual condition, then we won't know what to pray for. And the chances are, when we pull back and shoot that arrow, it's going to miss the mark. <clears throat> Four things that hinder prayer. The first thing that will hinder prayer is unrepented sin. Uh, God won't hear the prayers of a man who carries unrepented sin in his heart. Uh, as a matter of fact, men who willfully sin cannot move the heart of God to do anything. John chapter 9, verse 31. Now, we know that God heareth not sinners. Everybody listening to me? We know that God heareth not sinners. We know, if, so well, my prayer's not being answered. Well, we know that God heareth not sinners. Let's all say God heareth not sinners. But if any man, there's that conjunction. If any man, however, if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth the will of God, him God heareth. Well, pastor, if God won't hear a sinner, how can a sinner come to an altar of reconciliation, repent of his sins, and be saved? Because he's obeying what the Scripture just said. God hears not sinners, but if any man, worshiper of God, what does that mean to worship God? Worshiping God, we need to get this. Worship is the bowing of the human will in subjection to the will of God. That's worship. Now, praise is, whoop, hallelujah. Yeah, glory to God. That's praise. Worship is not my will. See, anybody can praise. Whoop, hallelujah. Glory to God. 
but not just everybody's willing to worship. A lot of folks willing to talk about Mariah. Not too, not too very many, though, willing to take their firstborn son up there and sacrifice him. That's the difference. That's what Abraham said. We're going yonder to worship. We're not going to go up there and jump around and shout hallelujah. Now, that has its place, especially if you're a worshiper of God. Then you need to praise God. But Abraham, in that essence, is telling us we're not going up there to jump around, shout, and beat tambourines and play loud music and say glory to God, hallelujah, and bounce off the walls. We're going up there to kill something. We're going up there to make a sacrifice. We're going up there to say, not as I will, but as thou wilt. So if any man be a worshiper of God, submits his will, and then doeth the will of God. What is the will of God? Let's read about it. The Bible tells us what the will of God is. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Some men count slackness. But is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but, there's another conjunction, but, however, what is he willing for us to do? Penance. So if any man will bow his will, worship, come to repentance, what does the Bible say in the book of John? Him God heareth. Hallelujah. And then, according to James 5, 16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. What is a righteous man? One that has bowed his will, repented of anything in his life. Now he's a righteous man. And the Bible says in James chapter 5, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. <clears throat> it's the righteous man who prays fervently that gets an answer from the Lord. If you've sinned, the Bible says, you don't need to be wallowing in it. You need to do something about it. That's right. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. Am I going too fast? Everybody with me? All right. It's a little early in the morning. Some folks have time, uh, trouble waking up in the morning. Some of you walked in here looking like zombies. I was hoping Brother Newton's song would wake you up and get you going. <clears throat> Some churches serve coffee. Some folks need to have a little coffee thrown on them. By the time they get into service, maybe they'll be wide awake. That woke you up. Okay. <clears throat> he that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. So what are we to do if we've messed up? Confess and forsake. Who do we confess our sin to? Well, we don't have a confessional booth around here. So who do you confess it to? You go to the Lord and say, I messed up. Please forgive me, Jesus. <clears throat> Hallelujah. <clears throat> First John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. St. <clears throat> John chapter 8, verse 11. Jesus said <clears throat> concerning the adulterous woman that was brought to him, remember he that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Jesus said, neither do I condemn thee. But then there was a caveat. Go and sin no more. That doesn't mean you come in here and be holy for about 45 minutes and you go out there and do all the dastardly stuff you've been doing. Hallelujah. You confess and forsake. That means you don't go back and do it again. Somebody say amen. <clears throat> Glory to God. And then what happens? Psalm 103.12, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. This scripture is a prophetic utterance, by the way, of David. He reached back into the tabernacle for a beautiful type and related that type as a shadow of the cross of Calvary that was to come some thousand years later when uh, he wrote, as far as the east is from the west, he was talking about the outstretched hands of Jesus Christ as he reached back into the tabernacle to find that type. <clears throat> so, Pastor, that's a little complex. I don't have time to explain it. You'll just have to trust me. Maybe someday we'll come in here and we'll talk about it for a while, but <clears throat> for now, some of you have already heard this, so you already know. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. If you messed up, repent. 
Let me point out, this was written to Christians. This is found in the book of Corinthians. The book of Corinthians was written to Christians. Okay, let me read it again. Some of you missed that. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Written to Christians. What does that mean? That means Christians mess up. But you don't carry that error around in your heart. Why? Because it will hinder your prayers. And believe it or not, there are going to be times, if they haven't already, that you're going to need to get a prayer through to God. And you don't need anything to hinder your prayers. <clears throat> Confess and forsake sin and leave it with God. Don't try to carry it around because you're not equipped to carry sin and be in a constant spiritual condition to pray. Jesus is big enough and strong enough to handle sin, so give it to him and forget about it. Now, the devil don't want you to forget about it. He'll keep reminding you. I preached a message about, goodness, 50 years ago, boots in the mud. <clears throat> Every time you get down to pray, Satan goes fishing. And he don't pull up catfish or brim. Or he pulls old muddy boots that you threw in the mud 10 years, years ago, 30. He pulls up old sins that you committed way back yonder that you thought you'd for, uh, forgotten about. And then while you're trying to pray and get a prayer through to God, what happens? He hauls those boots up and lets that mud rip right on the end of your nose and you pray and feel like you get a prayer right up to the ceiling and you can't get it any further. Why? Because Satan's not going to let you forget about it. But if you confess and forsake, God will forgive it. You can put it behind you because he has. <clears throat> Don't let unrepented sin hinder your prayers. <clears throat> the second thing is an unforgiving spirit. Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. And forgive us our debts. We recognize this immediately as the Lord's Prayer. Amen. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. For if we forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But there's that conjunction again. On the other hand, if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. If you hold anything in your heart against your brother, it will hinder you. Your prayers. Matthew 18, 21, then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often should I forgive uh, my brother's sin against me? Seven times? Jesus said, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. And now those of you who are quick in your head with math, you already know that's 490 times, but that's not what it means. You see, Seven is a number of spiritual completion or perfection, and 70 is a multiple of seven. Everybody still with me? Which indicates that a child of God is expected to forgive until he himself is perfected. This, doesn't, this is not talking about forgiving 70 times seven times in just one lifetime or one week or even one day. It's to cont continue to forgive until it doesn't bother you anymore. It's not, it's not a part of your conscious thought anymore. It's so far back in the recesses of your mind, you don't even remember it when you meet that brother or sister. You forgive until it is no longer part of your conscious thought. <clears throat> Amen. We forgive right on into eternity. Why? Because that's the way Jesus forgives our sins and shows us mercy. The Bible says, Ooh, hallelujah, Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Hallelujah. That thing you did five years ago, ten years ago, when you got up this morning, God says, it's all right, it's covered. Satan comes up and he said, but wait a minute, Lord. You remember that awful thing they did 35 years back. God says, what thing? I don't remember anything. Why? Because his mercies are new every morning. Every time I get up, he wipes that slate clean. Every, whoo, hallelujah. I don't face a new day with sin in my life. Why? Because his mercies are new every morning. 
I'm not going to get up. And Jesus, you know what I was just thinking last night while you were asleep? It really bugs me because I remember what you did. You remember what you did three years ago? You know what you said about that brother and that sister, and then it wound up turning into this, and then something else happened, and something else happened. Before you know it, the whole church was involved. You remember that? That's not what God does. <clears throat> he gets up and <laughs> Satan says, well, Lord, what about? What about what? <laughs> Why? Because, <sighs> because his compassions fail not. They're new every morning. No wonder he closed it out this way. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Saint of God can't afford to hold vengeance in his heart if he expects to get a prayer through to God. When Jesus himself was being crucified, he prayed a prayer from the agony of the cross. He, he cried, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. What a tremendous example he gave us. Imagine hanging on the cross, hearing the gambling of the soldiers for his garment at the foot of the cross, casting lots, hearing the cursing of one thief for the predicament he found himself in, and then seeing his own disciples in the distance standing in the shadow of the city walls. Yet even though he was surrounded by hatred and denial, he could look and say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Hallelujah. Stephen, the humble man who had been chosen as one of the church's seven leaders, would meet out the food from the saint's storehouse, could forgive even though he faced death. And as they were stoning him, He's saying, lay not this sin to their charge. Mm. A spirit of unforgiveness will hinder your prayers. So, Pastor, what, do you, what, if, I, what if I have done or said, or, then you go to that brother or sister and straighten it out. You tell them how sorry you are. <laughs> yeah, but it was their fault. doesn't make any difference whose fault it is. If it's hindering your prayers, you need to fix it. Whew. Whew. We're required to give until we ourselves are made perfect. Seventy times seven or right, actually right on into spiritual perfection. Somebody say amen. amen. The third thing that will hinder our prayers is the attitude in the home. Hmm. I better not spend a whole lot of time on this one. First Peter chapter 3, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. The wife of the home shouldn't be loud and boisterous and, and her conduct and mannerisms. As a matter of fact, Peter exhorted the wives to manifest a meek and quiet spirit. I know that's difficult for some. but it is a scriptural guideline. This exhortation is not merely an idle request made for no reason. Actually, the first part of the chapter reveals that by manifesting such a spirit, the wife, who is godly, will actually be able to win her husband to the Lord if he's lost. <clears throat> Amen. I, uh, I lived in a home with an unsaved father until I was about 15 years old. As a matter of fact, my dad received the Holy Ghost on Saturday night after I had preached he and Brother Ross Riles came to the Lord the same night. And I remember <clears throat> during that early part of life, my dad would smoke like a freight train. We'd get to church smelling like cigarettes. So, Pastor, I smoke cigarettes. God bless you. I'm praying that you'll, you'll get past that. God will forgive you for it. If you've got an alcohol problem, same thing. If you've got a drug problem, same thing. Well, it's not that bad. That's between you and God, but not that good either. And I hated cigarettes. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> my wife will tell you, <laughs> if there's any strong odor, I start choking up. I can't handle it. <laughs> my dad had a cigarette problem. I never had that problem. <clears throat> but there were some, sometimes he would, uh, well, he'd be a sinner. Now, he, I never heard my dad cuss, never saw him drink, n nothing like that. He never beat us. He, he, he whooped us.
but it was never beaten. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> but I remember because my mother had been a pastor from the year before I was born. And she pastored and loved people and prayed. And many times I heard her in her bedroom with the door locked pray. She'd be praying for everybody in the church. She'd be praying for my dad. But I was 15 years old. By that time, mother had been pastoring the church for 16 years with an unsaved husband. But I never, not even once in my life, saw my mother conduct herself in any way but with kindness, love, patience toward my unsaved father. Giving honor unto the wife is unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. She conducted herself in such a way as her life was a testimony, was a sermon that eventually converted him to salvation. And our children are a beautiful part of our homes. If we're in constant warfare with them, not only will they not respect us as parents, but they also, this disrespectful attitude can uh, ruin an otherwise potentially fruitful prayer life. Uh, prayer life. It's, it's essential to be holy in God's house, but it's also essential to be holy in every other aspect of our lives. There's no excuse going into our homes laying all holiness aside and conducting ourselves in a manner that is not becoming a saint. Godly home attitudes are vital that your prayers be not hindered. You know, I can see it on folks' faces sometimes when they come into church. Uh, you can often tell if uh, the spouses are spatting because l their looks can kill. They got that tight facial expression, that narrow gaze. <clears throat> And you know good and well, you don't know what they said. You might not know how bad it got unless you see blood. But you can tell. Whatever, I don't know, maybe it started at home. Maybe it started when he ran that caution light. I don't know. But by the time they get here, you can tell something's up. Well, let me just tell you, if that attitude persists, and you say, Jesus, will you? He'll say, no, can't help you. Why? Because an attitude in home can hinder your prayers. What did the Bible say? That your prayers be not hindered. Let me talk to you about this final, final hindrance to prayer. Bitterness. Bitterness. Definition for bitterness, the Webster's Dictionary definition is causing sharp pain in the body, a discomfort to the mind, exhibiting strong animosity marked by resentfulness. Hebrews chapter 12, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. The Greek definition for the word bitterness as is used in Hebrews chapter 12 is literally a bad man. In other words, a man in whom the seed of anger over some offense has grown into a plant that spreads its resentful roots of bitterness into the lives of others. Uh, many years ago on Broadway in downtown Columbus, the sidewalks were laid along the uh, uh, street, which was a brick road. And uh, there were beautiful trees, oak trees that lined the road. And the old homes down there that uh, many, many years ago uh, were just, just beautiful, <clears throat> some very ornate. And in recent years, they've started to uh, uh, renovate some of those. <clears throat> but uh, I remember going down there, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 years ago, and the oak trees had spread their root systems out. And they had grown up under the sidewalks, causing them to crack and bulge upward, using the sidewalks as like, almost like tackling an obstacle course. Well, if a child of God ever allows anger to grow out of the seedling stage, it will develop a root system of bitterness. This will not only destroy your prayer life, 
It'll gradually creep into the lives of those around you and begin to destroy everything it touches. It will cause cracks in friendships. It'll cause relationships to fracture and a church to become disjointed and lifeless. Bitterness will kill your prayer life. The child of God is kept purified through his prayer life. It's, it's through prayer that we praise and supplicate and intercede and travail and talk to God. It's prayer that keeps the stream of communication between the saint and the Savior open. Prayer like a stream of water reaches up to God, and he in the Spirit reaches down to answer our prayers. This is where that old treacherous root system of bitterness comes in. Those roots begin to grow out of our eyes and our ears and our heart. And before we realize what's happened, they built a dam in that life-giving stream of our prayer lives and stopped the beautiful flow of communication between us and God. If anger ever gets out of the seedling stage, it will produce lasting roots of bitterness This is why it's so vitally important to rid ourselves of any ill feelings that may arise in our hearts. The Bible says, be angry and sin not. If we had time, I could tell you the story of Haman. You can read his story of bitterness in the book of Esther. He built a gallows upon which to hang the object of his bitterness, that is Mordecai, but wound up hanging on that gallows himself because bitterness kills. It's a shocking story of what happens when anger grows into bitterness. Don't ever give anger a chance to grow up because it will always develop a root system of bitterness. It will hinder your prayers. I said bitterness will hinder your prayers. Let me talk to you for a little bit about uh, spiritual alignment. Those are the three things that will hinder your prayers. But what if my prayer is not answered at all? What if a day goes by, a week, a month, a year, five years? My, uh, my mother prayed for my dad to receive the Holy Ghost for 16 years or more. She just kept, we've talked about memorial prayer, she just kept making payments and just kept praying. If prayers are not answered at some point, then we must ask ourselves, well, what is the will of God in this matter? Pastor, I've been praying praying for something for five years. I've been praying for my husband to be saved for 40 years. Well, then maybe you need to pray, well, what is the will of God in this matter? Is that really a thing, Pastor? Oh, yes. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, and this is the confidence we have in him, that is, in the Lord. If we ask anything, let's all say anything. If we ask anything according to his will, he'll hear us. And if we know that he hears us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. If we ask anything according to his will, let's all say according to his will. God's word contains his will. His will is in here, but his will is also in heaven. There are things things in God's will in heaven. There are things that God has determined that he wants that you might not find in here. For example, God wanted my daddy saved. I I don't find Howard in this, but that was the will of God. How do you know? Because he was saved. All right. Psalm 119, 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Settled, fixed, permanent, sure, unwavering. God has a will. We don't, we don't know all of it. We know what he's given us in this. But we don't know all of it. I don't know who all is going to be saved. I know that God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But I also know that all are not going to come to repentance. Do you think the whole world's going to be saved? What's all that mumbling about? Let me just tell you, the whole world's not going to be saved. If you've ever read Revelation, you found that out. A lot of people are not going to be saved. There are going to be billions of people not saved. 
But there are going to be a lot of people saved. And thank God this group's one of them. I can tell some of you aren't sure. Well, we're going to give an altar call here in just a little bit. You fix that before you leave. Hallelujah. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Uh, Let me show you my grocery list. You got my grocery list up there, Duke? There it is. It's my grocery list. It's not my wife's. But she'll tell you, if I go to the grocery store, I'm going to make sure these items are on my grocery list. (laughs) Uh, Half a pound of honey maple ham. By the way, you go to Publix to get this. (laughs) One loaf of honey honey wheat bread, six pack of Diet Pepsi, two bananas, and uh, half a pound of grapes. That's my grocery list. Those are my words. That is my list. It contains my will, not my wife's. She got her own grocery list. It looks nothing like this. So if I give you my list, my words, my will, my grocery list, please don't come back with a pound of souse meat, a can of hominy, and a box of oatmeal. That's not on my list. That is not my will. All right? Well, God has a grocery list. God, everybody listening to me? God has a grocery list of things that he wants done that clearly indicate what his will is. For example, God wanted Noah to build an ark. So Noah didn't build a house. He built an ark. God wanted Abraham to prove his love for him and his faith in him. So he said, go up Moriah and sacrifice your son. Abraham didn't go up Moriah and sacrifice a goat. Why? Because that wasn't on God's shopping list. His grocery list said, sacrifice Isaac. God wanted David to slay Goliath. So David found five smooth stones and he killed the giant. All these things were the fulfillment of God's will or God's word, which contains his will. And according to the scripture in the book of Psalms, his word, that is his will, it's forever settled in heaven. It doesn't vary. It doesn't divert from its original intention. That's what God wants. And whether men do it or not is is up to them because they're their own free moral agent. That's why you can be lost if you want to. God's not going to slap you upside the head, drag you to an altar of reconciliation, and pound the Holy Ghost into you. That's a choice you make. If you want to be saved, he'll fill you with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. But if you don't want to be saved, he's not going to make you. If you choose to go to hell, that's your option. When we pray and nothing happens after we've dropped our prayers in the memorial box, We need to move into that third dimension of prayer and faith in order to align ourselves with the will of God in a matter. And when we've entered that third dimension of prayer and faith, God has called us up into the cockpit of the plane to see things before they ever happen rather than sitting back there in the passenger section and watching them go by. When we're up there in the cockpit, when we've reached that third dimension, so to speak, of prayer and faith, then we see what's happening before it ever happens. Oh, hallelujah. Psalm 65, 4, blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. God, once we're up there in that third dimension, God will reveal to us what his will is. Mm. He'll reveal his will for a person's healing. He'll reveal his will for a person's blessing. He'll reveal his will for a solution to a problem. He'll let us know when it is, what it is, where it'll happen, who it'll happen to. Why? Because now we've moved into, and I'm going to talk about that. Do I have time? I don't have time. Who just gave me license to keep going? (laughs) Well, hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
All right, we've mentioned the three dimensions of prayer. All right, well, at least I've, I haven't really gone into the detail. I've got it here to go into. And, uh, but we've mentioned the three dimensions of prayer and faith. <clears throat> and I need to identify those three dimensions for us. <clears throat> but bear in mind this. If we've prayed and nothing's happened, we need to, as the Bible says, we need to pray according to the will of God. What that means is we've got to align ourselves with what God wants. That's easier said than done. Why, Pastor? Because we are flesh. Pinch it. See, it's flesh. And that flesh has got a, a will of its own. And I can just tell you, 99.99% of the time, what that flesh wants is not at all what God wants. So we must align ourselves with what God wants. And in order to do that, you've got to lay aside the flesh. I'm serious. I've got another lesson here to teach. Brother, that, you patiently wait until next time. Will you folks sit through this for the second session? Would you? I can't tell how you voted, so I'm not really sure. <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll do it. Maybe we'll do it next next month or something. <clears throat> Let me quit right there. Uh, yeah, the Bible says, remove thy foot from thy neighbor's house, lest he grow weary and hate thee. I don't want to wear out my welcome. So, I'll talk to you about the three dimensions of prayer and faith. The next time we have this lesson, we'll pick it, pick it up right here where we left off. <clears throat> uh, what we want to do, let me just tell you, what we want to do is get to that third dimension. Because when we get to that third dimension, that means we've left the first and second dimensions behind. And we're more spiritually in tune with God than we were back here in the first dimension. Which is where most people function in the first dimension. But we'll talk about it next time. Let's all stop. Amen. What a tremendous lesson. Amen. I have several announcements I need to share with you uh, this morning. Uh, just a reminder to come with us and care Christmas sponsorship program. If uh, it's asked if you can to give a $12 donation that enables the residents of six local facilities to receive Christmas gifts from the Church of Columbus. And if you are making a check, please make it payable to the Church of Columbus with a notation for a convalescent care ministry or CC ministry, and they'll ensure that they get that. Amen. Sister Sims asked if everybody can give a dollar a month. Amen. If you haven't been, if you haven't done that, if you can just do a twelve dollar donation, they start preparing them. Amen. I think around this time, in order to ensure that our residents get something from the Church of of Columbus. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> Tuesday night. Ladies' prayer and Bible study, if you attend that, just Sister Richards wanted to make you aware that it will be in the chapel this Tuesday because the youth choir, amen, will be practicing in preparation for the service this Friday night. We all need to be here, amen. They have their annual riot night service this Friday night at 730. Brother Nathan French is going to be ministering, amen, and God is doing great things here at the Church of Columbus, Amen. Encourage you to be here Friday night at 7:30, and uh, it'll be a great blessing to each and every one. Bring somebody, Amen, to the house of the Lord, and let them be blessed. Do you like what you feel in the house today? Hey, man, why don't we give them a heave offering of praise this morning? Uh, glory to God! I am so thankful to be alive in the house of the Lord. Amen. We're gonna go to the Lord in prayer this morning. We have quite a few requests. Uh, Sister Langle had surgery on Thursday and uh, doing very, very well, but both her and Brother Langle have the flu this morning, so they are unable to be here. Sharon Ivy needs health and healing. And also, Mary Jo Riles has another friend that has uh, breast cancer, and she's asked us to pray. Raquel Calderon needs a speedy recovery from arm surgery this week. And we also need to remember Israel and that God would move upon her nation and bring her peace. 
Paula Parker has health problems. Brother Black submitted this request. Paula Cutler has cirrhosis of the liver, and she's asking for prayer. Uh, again, Brother Black. And then also Daniel Hoover, Brother Dale's brother. They've discovered a large mass on his large intestines and asking the church to pray. You know, I was reading my Bible this morning, and I, you know, thought about how the Bible is replete with miracles throughout its pages. In the Old Testament, I read that God reached down from heaven and he parted the sea so Israel could escape her enemies. God held back the Red Sea and made her water stand upright as if standing at attention at the presence of God. And he allowed several million people to walk through its deaths onto dry ground. And as God often does, he inexplicably positions his people for the miraculous to happen. We've got to believe and expect for the Lord to move. You know, we can't just say, I hope so, but God, I believe that you're going to do the miraculous. You have put me in a position that I have to trust you because there's no natural way out. And I thought about the walls of Jericho that just came down with a shout and the blow of a trumpet and how Jesus healed the sick, the blind. He even raised the dead. Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises to God in prison and suddenly there was a great earthquake and the chains fell off and doors swung open and they were free. And I want to encourage you this morning that there is nothing that is too complicated for your God to handle. Not then and not now. As a matter of fact, God says, for with God nothing shall be impossible. He has the ability to do what you cannot expect him to do but if you can believe him he will part the red sea of your trouble if you believe him he will raise the dead he'll heal the sick he'll set you free nothing is too difficult for God to handle and as we stand this morning what can you believe God for but I can tell you that if we will obey his word and cast all our care upon him, he's going to do something special for each and every one of us. You've got to, to commit to his care the problems that you face. There was a time I was all alone and I didn't know what to do, but God sent the solution. There was a time where I didn't have any meat in the refrigerator, in the freezer, and God said, look again, and miraculously there was hamburger that I did not see there were times that I didn't have gas money but God provided the means for it to happen God can do anything he'll even give you a new roof if you ask him for it he did it for me didn't cost me a dime $5,700 and I looked in the checking account a day or two later and there was miraculously the amount of money I needed deposited in my account for the roof that I asked God I didn't want to pay for. Now, if God can do that to me, he can do that for you. Can we go to the Lord in prayer this morning? Heavenly Father, you see all these needs, Lord, and we know that God, if we can believe you for it, God, you can part the Red Sea. Heavenly Father, you can raise up the dead dreams in our life and bring them to pass. Heavenly Father, we pray for those that are afflicted in their body. We pray for healing for the Langles, Lord, and for Sharon Ivy. And also, Lord, we curse this breast cancer, Lord God, from Mary Jo's friend. We ask that, God, you would raise them up and they would declare that you are God and you are on, amen, the throne in their lives, oh, Lord. And we pray for Rachel Calderon that you would continue to heal her. Lord, we pray for Israel and her peace, God. You said that if we pray for the peace of Israel, Lord God, that you will hear us, Lord, and move on our behalf. And we ask that you would pray, Lord God, and Lord, touch this nation. Lord, we pray for Paula Parker. We pray for Paula Cutler, that God, you would heal their both of their affliction. We pray for Daniel Hoover, that God, you would do for him what you did for Dale and heal him and make him whole. Heavenly Father, we thank you because you are so great. We're casting all our care upon you today. We're obeying your word and doing what you said to do. Lord, we thank you. And now we're going to sing praises to you. We're going to believe you for it. In Jesus' mighty name, the altars are open. You may come. 
we will touch and agree with you but let God do the miraculous for you you've got to step out for him to be able to do the miraculous you've got to trust him with your situation to see him move let's trust him this morning God bless you you may be seated mountain can be moved they say these chains will never break but they don't know you like we do there is power in your name we've heard that there is no
Would you lift your hands all across this building? It's such a reward to come to the house of the Lord as you live each and every day out there working and living your life. But when you come to the house of God, you feel those waves of refreshment and you feel the love of God. And I'm thankful that we have a beautiful edifice to come to feel his presence and to expect the miraculous. How about you? Amen. Amen. Um, while the ushers come, Pastor has asked me to remind you of your prayer time and your commitments and how important it is to be consistent throughout the month of October. I'm expecting the miraculous, and I know that if each and every one of us continue to do our part, we're going to see even more of what we've seen just in the few recent days with eight souls being baptized and several filled with the Holy Ghost. How awesome is that? seeing souls born into the kingdom of God. You might ask today, why do we give here at the Church of Columbus? And, and I thought about that question, and I thought, well, one of the reasons is that Jesus told us that if we did, we could expect that there were some things that we could expect in return. Scripture says, if we give, that it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down and shaking together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. For the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. And Jesus beautifully expands on the universal principle of giving, and it will be given unto you. If you do, God will. And uh, if we sow seeds, then we can expect to reap a crop. Amen. If we sow a seed of corn, we know that there's going to be four to eight stocks on that, that stock of corn because we sowed something into the ground and the same principle applies in the spiritual sense when you sow into the kingdom of god you can expect great returns and he teaches that a generous man or unselfish woman will not only reap the benefits from generosity in their giving but god is going to pour back out to you good measure whatever you sowed he's going to multiply you cannot ever outgive God. Our giving often results in deeds and gracious attitudes being reflected back to the giver. When you sow with a cheerful heart, God gladly pours right back into each and every one of us. Some of you have received raises on your job. Well, I can tell you, it's probably attributed to the fact that you're a giver to the things of God. Amen. That you sow into the kingdom. Some of you have recently maybe purchased a new house and God made a way when it was impossible but because you give to the work of God he honors that giving and he pours it back out to you so I encourage you this morning who wouldn't want to give to the Lord when you know that you're going to be touched not only in your spirit but also your finances and your well-being are going to be affected by the measure amen that you give out of that pure heart full of love and respect for the kingdom of God I want this kingdom of God to reach to the four corners of the earth, and you and I can do that. Amen. There's a city out there that needs to know who Jesus is, and he's in the Church of Columbus, and we want to introduce them to the great God that we serve. Can we bow our heads this morning? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this wonderful opportunity to express our love back to you. You've been so good and so gracious to each and every one of us, God, and we ask that you would bless and multiply all that is given this morning, God, because we love you. And we pray that, God, you would honor those and give back to them. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. God bless you. the word of the Lord and these are the days of his servant Moses righteousness being restored oh and these are the days of great trials of famine and darkness and sun so we are the voice in the desert crying prepare ye the way
There is nobody. There is nobody like Jehovah. There is nobody that deserves the praise Jehovah deserves. There's nobody that deserves a word of appreciation, an uplifted hand, a voice that says, Thank you, Jesus, like God deserves it. Simply we are here because of his grace and because of his mercy. Because God has been good to us. Oh, where would we be without the Lord? There's no God.
You know, I, I, I've been there. I've been in situations in my life that I knew that if I was going to get out or get through, it was only going to be because God made a way where there is no way. How many have been there before? And you just saw God do the miraculous in your life. So when we sing and we shout and we praise, we know what we're talking about. See, I don't just say there's no God like Jehovah just because it sounds good or there's a rhythm or there's a beat to it. It's that I know. I know because he's been good to me. He's been good to my family. When I didn't see a way out, God made a way out. So when I stand here and lift my hands and and jump and shout on one leg because sometimes that's all I have, I do it because God has been good to me. I remember the time where the only way out, the only way I was going to get where I needed to go, I couldn't do it with my strength. I couldn't do it with my intelligence. I couldn't do it with my knowledge. I couldn't do it myself. But we called on the name that is above every name. We called on the name of Jesus. And sometimes that's all we could say, say Jesus. Oh, and he made a way. We stand before you today because God is good. And many of us stand in this house today simply because of God's grace and God's mercy. It's not always easy, but it's always right to give Him praise and to acknowledge Him and to lift our hands and our voice to our mighty God. Amen. It's, it's so good to be in the presence of God. Amen. When you're in the presence of God, oh my God. You expose yourself to miracles, deliverance, salvation, because that's just what God is about. Amen. It's an honor to stand before you. I I tried my best to get a pastor to come back up and finished, but he said no, so you're stuck with me, at least until next week. Amen. I appreciate our pastor. Amen. Man of God. And Tremendous teacher, preacher, amen, of the Word of God. Appreciate the lesson this morning. Looking forward to next week. Amen. So much to learn, so much to gain about prayer. Amen. And uh, appreciate our pastor. Appreciate my, my beautiful family, my beautiful wife. Amen. And their support and their prayers for me, the ministry of this church. Amen. I tell you, we are blessed. Amen. We are blessed in this house. Amen. And I, I give honor to you. Amen. You, you're here today. Amen. And you have done, I think, what a church needs to do in order to prepare this type of service. You've worshiped. You've praised. Amen. God is so good. If you will, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 14, verse 2. 22, this isn't anything new. I believe that we are all very aware, or most of us are, of this portion of Scripture. But I just felt in my heart the last couple of weeks that this is what the Lord wanted me to minister here today. So I'll do my very best Amen. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22, and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into the ship. That means he had to uh, ask him more than once. Jesus ever have to ask you something more than once? Straight away Jesus constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. They didn't want to go. They wanted to stay with Jesus. But Jesus said, no, you go ahead. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves. 
For the wind was contrary. Everybody say contrary. The wind was contrary. That means it was blowing against the direction they wanted to go. The wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out of fear, out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter, being Peter, answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water. He walked on the water. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, everyone say, the wind did not stop. When he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said, O thou little faith. Wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of truth, thou art the Son of God. Amen. In Acts chapter 2, verse 40 says, And with many other words that he testify, short saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. And just for a moment today, I want to speak on the topic of contrary winds. Contrary winds. Amen. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Please pray for me. Amen. As we pray together. Lord, I thank you for what we feel in this house. I thank you for your spirit that's in this place. I ask, Lord, that you would guide me, direct me, help me, Lord, as I minister your word. Let it be you that speaks through me, God. And let me just be a vessel that is used by you to preach, dear God, this rhema word. Help us to respond, dear God, to you. I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would receive honor, glory, and praise today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. I was, uh, <clears throat> I was raised in West Texas for 18 years of my life. That's where I lived. There are many things, well, there's not many things in West Texas. If you know where I'm from, there's not many things there. It's called Plainview, and that's exactly what it is. <clears throat> but one thing I remember is the ungodly wind and the wind storms we would have. Winds would blast unexpectedly, and many times you would just have to turn your back and tolerate the wind until it blew past or blew over, or it did what it was going to do. The wind was a force to be reckoned with. I remember playing ball, softball, baseball, and it wasn't strange for a fly ball to go to right field and it'd be caught by the center fielder. So if you were able to catch a fly ball in West Texas, you were actually pretty good. Amen. Because it usually would not end up where it was hit, especially on those days when the wind had its way. I remember a time, amen, when some of my friends and I had gotten together to just play a pickup football game. And then in the midst of the game, with no warning at all, a dust storm picked up. And I, I remember there was, you know, it was a pickup game, so we had it. I would say I was probably 14, 15, 16, but, you know, you'd pick up, you pick up whoever. So I remember this little boy just stopping and yelling and, and turning and pointing. And 
I mean, all, all you could see was a dust cloud, and it was coming. And we were out in plain view. There's no trees. I mean, it's not like Georgia. I often say the one thing that uh, blew my mind when I enlisted in the Army and Fort Benning was my assigned duty station. And when we got on the cab that was to take us from the airport to Fort Benning, I could not believe there were so many trees in the world. Not in plain view. There is no trees. No tree to hide behind. No tree to stop the wind. And so we just had to run to the nearest building. Amen. And just put our backs to it as the wind blew over. And uh, it, was, it was rough sometimes. Even now when we go, when we would go in the winter and it would be cold and ice. And sometimes you would just have to turn your back to the wind. It just... Because it's just, just, it was just not, it's merciless. Amen. The wind would be contrary. And it would seem it was never accommodating. Unless you were flying a kite. But even then, I lost a number of kites. The wind is something to be reckoned with. In our text, the disciples were obliging Jesus. They wanted to stay with him, but he constrained them to get on the boat, to sail the road to the other side. We need to realize that, number one, they were obeying Jesus. Can I say this? Anytime you obey Jesus, there will be contrary winds. Amen. He sent them in the particular direction. These winds were common, but not necessarily predictable. We, to, we need to know that if he sent them, he knew exactly where they were. Amen. Can I say that again? If Jesus sent them in that direction, they were not lost to Jesus. Stay with me. Just for a moment. He knew exactly where they were. Oh, and by the way, let's not forget that he is the master of the wind. He knew <clears throat> the wind was coming. He knew they would toil. He still sent them. <clears throat> Because they were going to be exposed to his power. Do not despise where you are at this moment. You may be in a storm with contrary winds. But let me assure you that he knows exactly where you are. You are not lost to him. You just need to keep toiling and keep rowing in these contrary winds. Don't stop trying and give yourself to them. Because these winds are contrary to the direction that Jesus has sent us. Be patient with me. We're getting somewhere. Things may seem contrary to you. But he knows where you are. He knows what you need. Amen. Keep rowing, keep toiling, even when it seems you are not going anywhere. Amen. Because there are contrary winds in this place today. Winds that are contrary to your praise. Winds that form to make your praise difficult. Winds that keep you from this altar. Winds that are contrary to what God wants to do. We can do one or two things. We can complement these winds. Or we can go against these winds and do exactly what Jesus wants us to do. 
You know, the enemy is not your friend. The enemy is not someone who would just pat you on the back because he has your good in mind. He is here to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Jesus has come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. So when you come into this house and it's time to praise the Lord and lift your voice and you feel the presence of God, the inclination to this flesh that is against God is don't embarrass yourself don't respond they'll pull out a a old muddy boot and let it drip on your nose because your flesh is contrary to what god wants to do but is there are are there people here this morning that says i will not compliment the wind but i will go contrary to what my flesh wants to do what the enemy wants to do and i will praise god anyway i will magnify the lord anyway I will give him praise. I will give him honor. And I will give him glory. Because he's been good to me. And I'm only facing these winds. Because he sent me in this direction. You will always find contrary winds that come against you. Because the enemy would never compliment what God wants to do. He'll send something against you. Stay with me here. In Mark chapter 6, Mark, writing about the same instance, he said he saw them, Jesus saw them, toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. The Bible says he saw them toiling and rowing. You know what it was you know what that means? It was difficult to row in the direction they needed to go. It was hard to go in the way Jesus told him to go. There are times in your life when it's going to be difficult to go in the direction that Jesus wants you to go. But that's the way he wants you to go. Amen. That's, that's the direction that he gave us. And sometimes it's going to be hard to row that way. It's going to be hard to praise in that condition. It's going to be hard to worship and bow your will during that time. But we understand that we need to know. We need to be faithful. We need to understand that God sent us in that direction. So we must be faithful in our prayer time. We must be faithful in our devotion time. We must be faithful to the attendance of God's house even when it is difficult even when the winds are contrary because we understand we are in the going in the way of a miracle we have to pray sometimes when it's against everything that we feel Ever been there, Sister Richards? The last thing you wanted to do. Last thing this flesh wants to do. I wish I could say that every Sunday morning, this flesh 100% wants to praise God. You know, I'll make my way down here sometimes. Oh, I say, oh, here's a preacher talking. Confession good for the soul. What is he about to say? I hurt. I've had a rough week. Things ain't going my way. But I have to get right here, Brother Eddie. Even when this flesh doesn't want to. There are things in your life that you must do for God. Even when your flesh doesn't want to. My flesh says, go sit back down. You just failed. You have no right. You have no reason 
to be up here. Well, you know, regardless of what I went through this week and my failures and my weaknesses, it doesn't change the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross for me and he shed his blood for my sins and he gave everything he had in order to give me this right. So sometimes, even when it's hard and even when it's difficult, I'll raise my hands and, and, and I'll jump and I'll shout as much as I can because God has been good to me. Contrary winds cannot keep us or stop us from doing what we know is right in the kingdom of God. We come to this house because we need God. We need encouragement. We need His Spirit. We need His power. We need His deliverance. We need His salvation. And the moment we step into this place, contrary winds. That's why David said, I will enter into His gates with thanksgiving because He understood. As soon as I walk into that place and I'm not thankful, there's a wind. And I will enter his courts with praise. And he understood that. His mindset had to be. There are contrary winds that are facing my life. And if I'm going to. I'm going to step way ahead of where I am right now. If I'm going to win this thing, I've got to step out. I've got to step into the wind. I've got to step into contrary winds. If I ever want to walk on water. If I ever want to see my miracle. I got to be faithful even when it's hard being faithful. I got to pray when it's hard praying. I got to fast when it's difficult to fast because contrary winds will come. And there are some of us here today that are fighting things that are contrary to where God wants us to be. And I believe he sent me here to encourage you to keep rowing, to keep praying, to keep praising, to keep worshiping. Because he knows exactly where you are. Give me a moment. I know. I'm fighting contrary spirits. We have to praise sometimes even when it's against everything we feel. Because this flesh is contrary to the voice of God. In Romans 8, 6, it says, To be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because a carnal mind is enmity, what? Against, contrary to God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. To be carnally minded is death, it's separation from God. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because this carnal mind is contrary to God. So we all battle. We try to think it through, right? We try to put line upon line on ourselves. It's got to happen this way. I, uh, uh, yeah, okay. So I'll praise God when? When our, everything is all right. When I, when I can put this away. When, when I, I can stop doing this. And when I start acting right. And, 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 then, and, and then, uh, then, 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 I, then I can praise God. You'll never praise God. Let me tell you that right now. That's a revelation. You will never praise God if you wait for everything to be all right before you praise him. I'm telling you, you got to praise him when everything ain't all right. Because to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be carnally minded is death. That is separation from God. Carnal mind says, get yourself straight, then come to God. No, but a spiritual mind says, in your flesh, you are weak. But I got the power in, the, in God. The Holy Ghost. And you shall receive power. When? Not before. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Not before. You don't have a power to get anything right before. It's not until after. 
Until after you get into the spiritual mind that says, you know what? I don't care what the devil says. Victory is mine. I don't care what the doctor says. Healing is mine. Spiritually minded. Why? It's life and peace. To understand that you are in the hands of the creator, the master of the universe. That's life and peace. To understand that God's got your back. That's life and peace. Oh, help me, Jesus. I hope this is making sense to you. So, oh, so to obey God, it is contrary to the flesh. Romans 8 9 says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. If any man, oh, here we go. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Why we struggle? Because sometimes we want to leave the Spirit behind and do it on our own. We want to put the Holy Ghost here and let me go deal with this on my own. It don't work that way. It does not work that way. If you don't have the Spirit of, of Christ, you're not His. It's important to be how did John write it in Revelations 1.10? He said, I was, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Well, when's the Lord's Day? Oh, I was on the Spirit on Sunday? The Bible tells me this is the day. This is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. So what, what's the Lord's Day? Is that on Sunday? Is that on Wednesday night? Is that when I get in the Spirit? No, I get in the Spirit on Lord's Day. That's every day. I'm taking a lot longer than I need to. When Peter saw Jesus, Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be you, let me come to thee on the water. And what did Jesus say? Come. Let me ask you a question. When Jesus told Peter to come, Did Jesus calm the wind? Did Jesus stop the storm so that Peter could have a pleasant walk on the water? He said, hold on, Peter. Stop. Let the storms of life stop. All right, Peter. Now we got everything calm. Everything's all right. All right, now come. Now come. Did he? So what makes you think that in your life, Jesus is going to straighten everything out for you, for you to come to him? No, because he wants you to know that you step out on faith, even in the midst of your storm. God, I'm all undone. Can I come to you? He has one word for you, come. But while you're coming, understand there are contrary winds that want to keep you from coming to this altar and get it right with God. You'll think of situations. You'll think of problems. You'll think of every reason not to come to this altar. And, and if you allow the flesh, it'll kill you. But if you say, oh God, I want to come to you. He'll say, come. Contrary winds and all, you come. Bid me come. He says, come. All right, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I hope this makes sense. You know, Peter, you need to to step out of that boat. Take a step of faith. You need to praise anyway, sing anyway, shout anyway. You need to come to the altar anyway. Everybody say, I need to go to the altar anyway. Everybody say, I need to go to the altar anyway. I need to go to the altar anyway. Even though it's Brother Vidal preaching, I need to go to the altar. Shadrach, when they refused, the Bible says they were tossed in the fiery furnace. The wind was contrary to their worship. It was contrary to everything the world was doing. According to Daniel, they were the only ones standing and not worshiping. It was against them. 
But they said, you know what? We're not going to bow. The wind was contrary. Oh, you're not going to bow? Fine. That's fine. We're going to throw it in the fiery furnace. Throw it in the fiery furnace. But I'll tell you what. The wind is contrary, and I'm going to keep rolling. 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 All right? They're throwing in the fiery furnace. What does Daniel 24, 25 say? And Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, rose up in haste, and spake unto the counselors. Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered, oh, yeah, king, that's what we did. He answered, I don't see three. I see four. And they're walking around in the fire. And they have no hurt. And the former, the fourth. It's like the Son of God. Contrary winds. Contrary winds. When Daniel prayed, when he was told not to pray, he said, all right, Daniel, you're not going to pray? All right, we'll, we'll cast you in the lion's den. I'm going to pray. I'm going to keep rowing. I'm going to keep toiling. Come on, Daniel. This is the decree says you can't pray to anybody but the king. He said, I only have one king. I want you to know that. And that's what I'm going to pray to. All right, Daniel. I'm going to put you in the lion's den. All right. Daniel 6, 21. Then said Daniel to the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouth that they have not hurt me. He showed up. Who showed up? Jesus showed up. The Lord showed up. He did not stop the wind. He showed up in the wind. And the winds that are contrary in your life, Jesus today is showing up in your wind. You have a couple more examples. I'll say a couple. I probably have three or four. The woman with the issue of blood, she needed healing. All her life, for over 12 years, she needed healing. The Bible says that people were surrounded by Jesus. It's contrary to winds. The thing is that it's not that Jesus isn't available. The question is, how bad do you want to get to Jesus? That's the question. Because she made her way to him, touched the hem of his garment, and immediately, contrary to winds. Last example. In Matthew 15, we read about the Syrophoenician woman that came to Jesus. The Bible says, behold, there came a, in Matthew, it says a Canaanite woman came, a woman from Canaan came to Jesus and said, I need, I need you. Listen to me. She said, I need you. I need you. My daughter is vexed with the devil. I need you. Jesus ignored her wind 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 come here Hoy. be wind wind come on it's all right you'll be all right you're gonna be famous on television to all the north side you you on tv go on youtube and see you wind contrary jesus this wind was contrary then i thought it was funny didn't you come on then his disciples said, Jesus ignored her. Then the church said, send her away. Contrary. A miracle. Wouldn't give her the time of day. His disciples said, send her away. But she, the Bible said, persisted. Finally, Jesus said, it's not your time. You know what happens to us is we quit right there. We quit. It's not my time. Let me know when, Jesus. I'll be back next Sunday. Contrary wins. Jesus said, it's not meat for me to give this food. To the dogs. You know, she wasn't a Jew. 
It wasn't her time. Her time was after Calvary. After Jesus had died, that's when we all. So in actuality, we're in her place. At that time, it wasn't our time. Like right now, some of you are saying, this isn't my time. But the Bible says, she persisted, she persisted, she persisted. And what's the next thing she did? Come on, go to the next verse. So where's the next verse up there? See, he answered and said, it's not me. She said, truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Let's go back a couple of verses where it says she persisted. Let me find it. You'll find it. She came and she worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. But he answered not. And Jesus answered, a woman great is thy faith. I think it was in Mark that it says she persisted and she worshipped. She persisted and she worshipped. She had persistent worship. When the wind was against her, she didn't stop. She didn't stop. She didn't stop praying. She didn't stop coming to the altar. She didn't quit. She said, it's not your time. But when she worshiped, you see these contrary winds, a lot of times we want to just go along with them. Okay, no, how, how, how bad do you need Jesus to intervene in your life right now? Y'all can sit down, thank you. Because she had contrary winds coming from every direction. Like you do. Like you do. You have every reason not to live for God. You have every reason not to come to this altar this morning. You have every reason. You have contrary winds in your life. Let's all stand together. Don't let your contrary wind keep you from your miracle. I do not know what your contrary wind is telling you, but there's a Jesus here today waiting for you to step through and step out to him. There are many reasons not to. But you only one, need one reason to step out. Jesus, Peter, said to Jesus, bid me come. Listen to this. But when Jesus and Peter got back on the boat, the wind ceased. When he got him on the boat, when he got him on his side, the wind stopped. Contrary winds. Today I want to invite you to step out of your contrary wind and come to this altar. There's a miracle waiting for you. There's salvation waiting for you. Some of us need to save ourselves from this world. So I'm going to ask if there's anybody here that needs a miracle. Come on. If there's somebody. Yeah. You have winds that are contrary to you right now. Things that are telling you, don't go to that altar. You never will. But I'm going to ask you that for you to come. Whatever it is, if you need healing, if you have a financial need, if you need salvation, Come on. Come on. Don't hesitate. When Jesus told Peter, come, he said, I'm going, Jesus, right now. I'm not waiting for the wind to stop. I'm coming in the midst of my personal storm. I'm stepping out. That's what Jesus is asking you. He's not asking for everything to be perfect in your life. What he is asking is for you to step out in faith and believe in him. 
Once you get him involved in your miracle, then the wind will stop. Come on. Hallelujah.